Well, hello there! Welcome to the Unique History Channel. Tonight, we're going to be doing a selected reading from The Secret Behind Communism by Dr. David Duke. And we'll be doing cha Chapter 2 to Chapter 4. Chapter 2. The Ethnic War on the Russian People. The following includes much of Frank Britton's historical research with my updating, edited, editing, and commentary added. Under the reign of Tsar Alexander I, Tsar from 1801 to 1825 of Russia, many of the restrictions against Jewish residents beyond the pale of settlement were relaxed, especially for the artisan and professional classes. A determined effort was made to establish Jews in agriculture and the government encouraged at every opportunity of the assimilation of Jews into Russian national life. Nicholas, Nicholas I. Alexander's successor, Nicholas I, Tsar from 1825 to 1855, was less inclined to favor Jewry, and in fact, viewed their inroads into the Russian economy with alarm. He was hated by the Jews. Prior to his reign, Alexander I had allowed any male Jew the privilege of escaping compulsory military duty by paying a special draft exemption tax. In 1827, Nicholas I abolished the custom result that Jews were, the, for the first time, taken into the imperial armies. In 1844, Nicholas I further antagonized Jewry by abolishing the institution of the Kalal, and in the same year he prohibited by law the traditional Jewish garb, specifying that all Jews should, except on ceremonial occasions, dress in conformity with Russian standards. These measures, and many others like them, were aimed at facilitating the assimilation of Russian of Jewry into Russian life. The Tsarist government was concern, concerned by the Jews' failure to become Russianized and viewed with extreme hostility. The ancient Jewish custom of maintaining a separate culture, language, mode of dress, etc., all of which contributed to keep the Jew an alien in the land of his residence. It is in this determination to Russianize and assimilate Jewish extremists that we can ascribe the unusual efforts made by the imperial government to provide free education to its Jews. In 1804, all schools, schools were thrown open to Jews and attendance for Jewish children was made compulsory. Compulsory education was not only a novelty in Russia, but in any country in the early 19th century. In Russia, education was generally reserved for the privileged few. Even as late as 1914, only 55% of her Gentile population had been inside a school. The net result of the imperial government civilization program was that Russian Jewry became the best educated segment in Russia. This eventually worked the destruction of the Tsarist government. Alexander II. The reign of Alexander II marked the apex of Jewish fortunes in Tsarist Russia. By 1880, they were coming a dominant in professions, many trades and industries, and beginning to filter into government in increasing numbers. As early as 1861, Alexander had permitted Jewish university graduates to settle and hold governmental positions in Greater Russia, and by 1879, Apocrisies, nurse, midwives, dentists, distillers, and skilled craftsmen pretended to work and reside throughout the empire. Nevertheless, Russia's Jews were increasingly, increasingly rebellious over the remaining restraints which still bound the greater part of Russian Jewry to the Pale of Settlement, and which to some extent restri restricted their commercial activities. Herein lied the dilemma. The imperial government could retain certain restrictions against the Jews, and by doing so, incur their underlying hostility or could remove all restraints and pave the way for Jewish domination over every phase of Russian life. Certainly Alexander II viewed this problem with increasing concern as time went on. He lost an incredible amount of his enthusiasm for liberal causes after the attempt was made to assassinate him in 1866. He dismissed his liberal advisors and from that time on displayed an inclination towards conservatism. It's not to say he became anti-Jewish, but he did show more firmness in dealing with them. In 1879, there was another attempt in his life, and another in the following year when the Winter Palace was blown up. In 1881, a plot hatched in the home of Jewess Heisa Helfman was successful. Alexander II was blown up and ended so in era. The May Laws. The reaction to the assassination of Alexander II was instantaneous and far-reaching. There was a widespread belief in, in and out of the government that if Jews were dissatisfied with the rule of Alexander II, whom the crypto Jew Disraeli had described as the most beloved prince that ever ruled Russia, then they would be satisfied with nothing less than outright domination of Russia. Up to 1881, 
Russian policy had been consistently directed in attempting to Russianize the Jew preparatory to accepting him into full citizenship. In line with this policy, free and compulsory education for Jews had been introduced and repeated attempts had been made to encourage them to settle on farms and special efforts had been made to encourage them to engage in the crafts. Now Russian policy was reversed and herefore it became the policy of the imperial government to prevent the further exploitation of the Russian people by the Jews. Thus began the death struggle between the Tsar and the Jew. Although 1881 there was widespread anti-Jewish rioting all over the empire, large numbers of Jews who had been permitted to settle beyond the Pale of Settlement were evicted. In May of 1882, the May Laws, provisional rules of May 3rd, 1882, were imposed, thus implementing a new government policy under Alexander III. The May Laws show the empire to its foundations. The following passage is taken from the Encyclopedia in Britannica. The Russian May Laws were the most conspicuous legislation monument achieved by modern anti-Semitism. Their immediate results was a ruinous commercial depression, which was felt all over the empire and which profoundly affected the national credit. The Russian minister was at his wit's end for money, and negotiations for a large loan were entered upon with the House of Rothschild, and a preliminary contract was signed. When the finance minister was informed that unless the persecutions of the Jews were stopped, the great banking house would be compelled to withdraw from the operation. In this way, anti-Semitism, which had already profoundly influenced the domestic policies of Europe, set its mark on the international relations of the powers, for it was urgent need of the Russian treasury, quite as the termination of Prince Bismarck's secret treaty of mutual neutrality, which brought upon the Franco-Russian alliance. Thus, with a period of 92 years, the Jews, although con- con- constituting only 4.2% of the population, had been able to entrench themselves so well in Russian economy that the nation was almost bankrupt in the attempt to dislodge them. And, as we have seen, the nation's international credit was also affected. Tensions between Jews and Zar- the Tsarist regime rise. After 1881, events served increasingly to sharpen the amenity of Jewry towards Tsarism. The May Laws had not only restricted Jewish economic activity, but attempted, attempted unsuccessfully, as we shall see, to preserve Russia's cultural integrity. Here there, Jews were permitted to st- attend state-sponsored schools and universities, but only in the ratio of the population. This was not unreasonable, since Russia's schools were flooded with Jewish students, while a large number of her Gentile population were illiterate. But to the Jews, this represented another bitter persecution. All the world was acquainted with the enormity of this new crime against Jewry. Alexander's III Proclamation of Jewry On May 23rd, a delegation of Jews headed by Baron Gosenberg calling the new Tsar Alexander III to protest the May laws and the alleged discrimination against Jewry. As a result of the investigation which followed, Tsar Alexander III issued an Abdict on the following September 3rd. For some time, the government has given attention to the Jews and to their relationship with the rest of the inhabitants of the empire. With view of the asserting the sad conditions of its Christian inhabitants brought about by the conduct of the Jews in the business matters, during the last 20 years, the Jews have gradually possessed themselves of not only every trade and business in all branches, but also a great part of the land by buying or farming. With a few exceptions, they have a body devoured their attention not to enriching or benefiting the country but to defrauding by their wiles its inhabitants and particularly its poor inhabitants. This conduct of theirs has called forth protests on the part of the people as manifested in acts of violence and robbery. The government, while on the one hand doing its best to put down the disturbances and to deliver the Jews from oppression and slaughter, have also, on the other hand, thought as of a matter of urgency and justice to adopt stringent measures measures in order to put an end to the end of repression by the Jews on uh, the inhabitants and free the country from their malpractices, which were is known for the cause of the allegations. Ironically, although the world is conditioned to think that attempts to limit all kinds of Jewish influence are a violation of human rights, the Tsar actually saw their efforts as a defense of the most basic human rights of their subjects. Of course, this perspective is not certainly allowed in the global media, where the same forces are well ensourced. Who was right and who was wrong? The time came when the Jewish Bolsheviks gained the upper hand and married the Tsar, his wife and children. 
they went on to commit some of the greatest mass murder in history, the sobering fact should historically answer the question about the whole ultimate violators of humanity actually were. Chapter 3 Born of the Same Roots Communism and Zionism It was in this atmosphere that twin movements of Marxism and Zionism began to take hold and dominate the mass of Russian Jewry. Ironically, both Zionism and Marxism were first proclaimed by westernized German Jews. Zionism, whose chief advocate was Theodor Herzl, took root in Russia in the 1880s in competition with Marxism, whose high priest was Karl Marx, the grandson of a rabbi. Eventually, all Russian Jews came to identify himself with either one or the other of these movements, Jewish terrorists in Russia. As an elf growth of this political fermentation, there appeared at the beginning of the century one of the most remarkable terroristic organizations ever recorded in the annals of history. This was the Jewish-dominated Party of Socialist Revolutionaries, which began in 1901 and in 1906 was responsible for the assassination of no less than six first-ranking first ranking members of the imperial government, including Minister of Education, Bologiov, Minister of Interior, Sipenyavin, Governor of Ufa, Boganovich, Premier Vyalkovich von Plevle, and Grand Duke Sergei, uncle of the Tsar, and General Dubrasov, who had suppressed the Moscow insurrection in 1906. The Jew Grigory Gudagunshi, the mastermind to terror against the Tsar's ministers. Meanwhile, Jews all over the world spread hate propaganda against Russia's imperial government. Chief architects of these terroristic activities was the Jewish Gregory Gunanshi, who headed the terrorist section of the Socialist Revolutionary Party and who was the confounder of the party. In charge of the fighting section was Yenov Azev, a son of a Jewish tailor and one of the principal founders of the party. Azov later plotted but was unable to carry out the assassination of Tsar Nicholas II. Avis was later exposed as working as a police spy and was forced to flee with the wrath of his Ernst Weil revolutionary comments to exile in Germany. Gernsey was arrested as a result of Azov's spy work and was sentenced to life imprisonment. This marked the end of the terroristic activities of the party, but the effect of these political murders was far-reaching. Never again was the royal family or ministers free from the fear of assassination. Soon another prime minister would be shot down, this time in the very presence of the Tsar. This was the backdrop for the revolution of 1905. Chapter 4, Bloody Sunday and the 1905 Revolution. The revolution of 1905, like that of 1917, occurred in an atmosphere of war. On January 2nd, 1905, the Japanese captured Port Arthur and thereby won the decisive victory of the Russo-Japanese War. Later in January, there occurred a tragic incident in which the immediate cause of the 1905 revolution was to affect the attitude of Russia's industrial population towards the Tsar for all time. This was the Bloody Sunday Affair. The imperial government, in its attempts to gain favor of the industrial population in its search for a way to combat Jewish revolutionary activity, had adopted the tactic of encouraging the formation of legal trade unions in which professional agitators were denied membership. These trade unions received official recognition and were protected by law. Father Gapion. One of the most outstanding trade union leaders, and certainly the most unusual, was Father Gapion, a priest in the Russian Orthodox Church. On the day part Port Arthur fell, a number of clashes occurred in St. Petersburg giant Plutnyov works between members of Father Gapon's labor organization and company officials. A few days later, the Plutnyov workers went on strike. Father Gapon resolved to take the matter directly to the Tsar, Nicholas II, Tsar from 1894 to 1917. On the following Sunday, thousands of St. Petersburg's working men and women and their families turn out to participate in this appeal to the Little Father. The procession, procession was entirely orderly, and the peaceful petitioners carried out carried patriotic banners expressing loyalty to the crown. At the palace gate, the procession was met by a flaming 
volley of rifle fire. Hundreds of workers and members of their families were slaughtered. This was Bloody Sunday, searched certainly one of the blackest days in the Tsar's history. Was Tsar Nicholas II responsible for Bloody Sunday, as the Marxist propagandists have claimed? He couldn't have been because he was out of the city at the time. Father Gapion had marched on an empty palace, but the harm had been done. The Revolution of 1905. Bloody Sunday was marked by beginning of the 19, 1905 Revolution. For the first time, Jewish Marxists were joined by a large member of, of the working class. Bloody Sunday delivers Russia's industrial population into the hand of the Jewish-dominated revolutionary movement. A strike broke out, broke out in Lodz in late January, and by June 22nd, this developed into an armed insurrection in which 2,000 were killed. Tsar Nicholas II acted at once again to recover the situation. In early February, he ordered investigation into the causes of unrest among the St. Petersburg workers, and later that year, in August, he announced the provisions for establishing a legislator, and later which became the Duma. He also offered amnesty to political offenders in which, incidentally, Lenin returned to Russia, but these attempts failed. On October the 20th, the Jewish Menshevik all led all Russian railway union went on strike, and on the twenty first a general strike was called in Saint Petersburg, and on the twenty fifth there was a general strikes in Moscow, Somalis, Kursk, and other cities. The Saint Petersburg Soviet is founded. On October twenty sixth, the revolutionary Saint Petersburg Soviet was founded. This Saint Petersburg Soviet assumed the functions of a national government. It issued decrees pro Proclaims an eight-hour workday, freedom of the press, and otherwise ex exercise the prerogatives of a government. From the very beginning, the Soviet was dominated by the Menshevik faction of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, although the Social Revolutionary Par Party was also represented. Its first president was Menshevik Zabrowski, who was succeeded by Grigory Nosor. He then turned in succeeded by Lev Trotsky who chiefly as, as a result of the prestige gained in 1905 became one of the guiding spirits of the October Revolution in 1917. Trotsky be became president of the St. Petersburg Soviet on December 9th, and a week later some 300 members of the Soviet, including Trotsky, were arrested. The revolution was almost, but not quite over. Part of us. On December 20th, the Jew Alexander Luchevich Padovas, real name Israel Lavarovich Gelf Gelfan, assumed control of a new executive committee of the Soviet and organized a general strike in St. Petersburg, which involved some 90,000 workers. The next day, 150,000 workers went on strike in Moscow, and there was, were insurrections in Shatia, Kansak, and Orostov. But within a week, the government gained the upper hand, and by the 30th of December, the revolution was over. Stoy Stoyopin reforms. As an outcome of the 1905 revolution, Tsar Nicholas II set about remedying the shortcomings of his regime in a most condemnable manner. At his decree, Russia was given representative government and a constitution. An elective legislator and the Duma was established. And free elections were held. By these measures and others which followed, Russia seemed unwell to becoming a constitutional monarchy patterned after the Western European model. And as point of fact, it was the only the outbreak of World War I which prevented this from becoming a reality. As soon would be expected, the Jewish Revolutionary Parties bitterly opposed these reforms, looking on them as merely a device which the force of revolution would be dissipated. Actually, these members did not succeed in fast pacifying the Russian masses. Between, did succeed in pacifying the Russian masses. In the years between 1905 and 1914, were the most comparative, quiet, and progressive. No man deserves more credit for the state of fear than Prime Minister Petr Arkandyevich Stoyplin, who, in the year following the 1905 result, emerged as the most impressive figure in Imperial Russia. From 1906 to 1911, it is no exaggeration to say that he dominated Russian politics. It was he who gave Russia the famed Stoipian Constitution, which, among other things, undertook to guarantee the civil rights of the peasantry 
which constituted 85% of Russia's population. His land reforms, for which he is most famous, not only gained the peasant the right to own land, but actually financed the person with government loans. Stoypin was determined to give the peasant a stake in capitalism, believing that the national counterweight of the communal principle is individual ownership. Where were Stolpin's land reforms effective, Bertram Wolf, an American Jewish Communist Party member and author who was on all points anti Zarist and pro-revolutionary, had this to say. Between 1907 and 1914, under the Stoypian land reforms, two million peasant families seceded from the village Meyer and became individual pro- profiteers. All through the war, the movements continued so that by January 1st, 1916, 6 million peasant families out of the approximately 16 million eligible had made application for separation. Lenin saw the matter as a race with time between Stopin's reforms and the next upheaval. Should an upheaval be postponed for a couple of decades, the new land message would be transformed the countryside that it would no longer become a revolutionary force. How near Lenin came to losing the race is proven by the fact that in 1917, when he called on the peasants to take the land, they already owned more than three-fourths of it. Russian Jewry wanted revolution, not reform. As early as 1906, the attempt had been made to uh, assassinate Prime Minister Stoypin when his country house was destroyed by a bomb. Finally, in September 1911, the Prime Minister of Russia was shot down in cold blood while attending a gala affair in Kiev theater. The assassin was a Jewish lawyer named Mordecai Gerovich Brogov. Thus, it w- was in Russia since 1902, two Prime Ministers lost to Jewish assassins. Many of Stoypin's reform were carried out after his death. In 1912, an industrial insurance law was inaugurated which gave all industrial, industrial workmen and women sickness and accident compensation to extents of two-thirds and three-fourths of the regular pay. For the first time, the newspapers of the revolutionary parties were given legal status, public schools were expanded, and the election laws were re- re- revised. In 1913, general amnesty for all political prisoners was given. Not even the severest critic of Tsarism could deny that these measures represented a sincere attempt on the part of imperial government to bring, down, bring about reform. Why, in spite of all this, was the Tsar Okay, thank you.